hopefully she will get uh, should be online very soon Yeah. But in the meantime, um, while uh, Nada is getting her stuff uh, sorted, uh, good morning, Gwen, uh, my co-champion. <laughs> I haven't seen you uh, since the very fruitful engagements of yesterday. Are you feeling better? I am living better. Yes, Toiva, thank you very much. Um, a very important topic, this media information literacy. And I've just come from the youth newsroom, um, where youth from across the world and across Southern Africa have been engaged. Um, and it's fascinating to hear their exchanges, hearing stories from one another, the cultural exchanges. And it reminds me of Vintuk 1991, because that was one of the first times we had chance to meet journalists from across the continent. And now the same thing is happening. And I think they've benefited tremendously from that exchange. So it's very valuable. And of course, information literacy, we need so much in this disinformation era to enable people to separate fact from fiction and lies from the truth. Indeed, Gwen. And uh, today is, of course, the 3rd of May. And uh, it was the likes of yourself and uh, many other African newspaper journalists in 1991 that started that conversation. Um, I'm told you, your mic can is now usable. Life. Yes. Life. <laughs> Just engage me, Gwen, while we are waiting for our colleagues to sort out those clages. Um, this day became, or is a product of efforts by the likes of yourself, 1991, um, sitting here in Vinduk, um, adopting the Vinduk Declaration, which then went on to uh, to get adopted at the highest level of the UN. Um, just what significance does this day hold for you uh, every year when it comes? Well, I think there's a lot of significance attached, as I say, and I've said before, a very proud moment for Namibia, a very proud moment for Africa to have kind of been at the forefront of a global push for free and independent media. So from that perspective, let me also wish everybody a very happy World Press Freedom Day. Because it's a day we talk about, you know, a lot of the problems faced by the media, and obviously sustainability, journalist safety, all those issues, but it's also a day to celebrate great journalism and great journalists, and, and that I think we must remember. And now to focus forward. The Vintuk Declaration was then, a will come out of this conference with the Vintuk Plus 30 Declaration, which will, I think, set the scene for a new era for journalism and for the media worldwide. And uh, that's going to be an exciting phase, and I hope I see much of it unfold. Very good. Um, I mean, I, I personally can't wait for the, the announcement of the adoptions later, um, or the announcements of uh, what, what the amplification of uh, those new resolutions. And uh, of course, we are, we are living in a different era now, and I'm sure uh, whatever is is deemed as a resolution will now help us traverse these new challenges that we faced. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit excited about this afternoon. Exactly, and also the sort of intersection of journalism and media information literacy. How do we as journalists bridge that gap? How do we address these issues of declining public trust in the media? What do we do about it? How do we stop people or get them to discern, uh, as I said earlier, good information from bad? These are major channel challenges, and that's why this panel is, of course, so crucial uh, for the way forward. You see? Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry for, uh, I'm communicating with my colleagues from the other, from behind the scenes. Uh, we are told that uh, the glitch that was uh, on the way, in the way of uh, that dialogue, very important dialogue, seems to have been sorted now. So we are crossing over now to uh, a very a live dialogue between the UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
Uh, that's Nada Al Nashif and uh, Media and Information Literacy. Well, it looks like we are just going to uh, Daniel for now, as a matter of fact, uh, to give us some uh, uh, conversation on that subject, very important subject. We, we are crossing over to Daniel now. Much and our sincere apologies for the, the little technical glitch. I'm happy and excited that it's all fixed now. I'm happy and excited that it's all fixed now. So my name is Omar Inze Daniel. I'm the Global Youth Coordinator for the Media and Information Literacy Alliance, a global network initiated by UNESCO um, that promotes media and information literacy, or what we we'll call MIO for short. For the last 15 months, the UNESCO-led Media and Information Literacy Alliance Youth Committee helped foster youth engagement in MIO globally in collaboration with various youth organizations around the world and were very instrumental in the UNESCO MIO's alliance response to the COVID-19 pandemic by carrying out a series of youth actions um, to counter the growing misinformation and disinformation or what the WHO DG Dr. Tedros called the infodemic. When we consider MIO competencies for young people, we see these competencies as supporting their rights um, and especially their rights to express themselves, um, their rights to impart, um, their rights to seek and to receive information, and finally their rights to privacy. We believe that MIL is vital if young people's engagement with media and internet content is to translate into information as a public good. Um, sincerely, uh, I'm so delighted and I have the honor um, to introduce the United Nations Deputy High Commission for Human Rights, uh, Ms. Nada Arnashif. Um, Ms. Nada Arnashif, thank you so much for joining this discussion at the World Press Freedom Day Global Conference. And I'm excited that um, we both have the honor to open the floor to very robust conversations um, on what about what press freedom day over to you now Ms. Nandana Shea. Okay, so so Daniel, um, uh, I'm so sorry my friend, but uh, uh, Nada is not online yet. So I'm advised that you should just uh, give us your input on the subject uh, and maybe to make life easier for you, uh, I thought you could share with us a few words on the media and information literacy. <laughs> Uh, alliance, and then of course move to the uh, uh, um, yeah yeah no 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 so 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 give us that give us a few words on the on, on the alliance that uh, I think you are very much involved. Uh, Nadal can come back later, maybe I speak only also as an individual alone on that on that subject. But but please address us on that. Sorry for, sorry for the inconvenience. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, about the work that we're doing at the Youth Alliance Committee, uh, give me a minute, I can hear myself, there's some kind of echo. Uh, can you hear me, Daniel? Okay, I'm not sure why the echo is but I, I'm not sure why I can hear you clearly, but I, I could also hear myself as I talk. Cause but I, I'll just go ahead if it's if it's just me and it's yeah. not affecting the live audience. Yes, please go ahead because we can hear you very well here. All right, thank you, thank you very much. So, um, the work that we do at the Youth Steering Committee has been very instrumental and has been very, very um, engaging. And presently, we, we work with young people in the five regions um, that UNESCO also works with and is present. And we've been working in driving conversations around media and information literacy, you know, helping to build up policies and programs that are specifically focused on young people um, to help promote the activities that young people are doing. The Youth Committee has a very mix of um, has a mix of professionals. We have journalists, we have content creators and developers, we have str um, strategic um, communications professionals, we have academics, we have researchers. And one of the things that we've been able to do over the past one year, especially before the um, coronavirus pandemic came in board and during the coronavirus pandemic, we had worked on developing um, um, a youth open letter that was addressed to heads of states and heads of heads of UN agencies on how you know we think that going forward we want young people to be engaged in media and information literacy. We also worked on developing um, regional action plans and a global action plan on how young people need to be engaged in uh, media and information literacy and the ideas that we or the ideals we want to push around engaging young people in media and information literacy. Um, one, one key thing that stood out for us is that it, it is not a we versus them issue um, because information. Um, 
misinformation and disinformation and fake news cuts across all ages and all sectors. So it's more about like a kind of co-ownership process for us to develop solutions and to develop um, programs and policies that will help us um, in time counter the issues um, that are being portrayed by by fake news. And I, I think one of the things that made our work so relevant and so very, very key was the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw a lot of um, first was this um, existence as to what were the origin of the vaccines, you know, what was the main purpose of the vaccine, and people, you know, denying that, um, sorry, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that oh, COVID-19 does not exist, it's a hoax, people want to use this to reduce the population and things like that. And then the conversation moved away from when the vaccines were now fully functional. They're like, oh, now the vaccine is used to reduce the population. I don't take it. It has this very adverse side effect and things like that. So one of the work that we did was to be able to counter um, the misinformation and the fake news around this. We had a series of um, webinars and we had a series of um, youth programs and we kind of tried to also translate um, a lot of the COVID-19 um, IEC materials into um, various multiple languages. And we work closely with the WHO um, Epidemic Information Network, you know, to help build up, you know, campaigns and programs and surveys to understand people's responses to um, to the vaccines or to the knowledge materials being shared um, around COVID-19. And then we had some, we looked at, okay, COVID-19 does not really just affect our health. Okay, what are the also, you know, other aspects that COVID-19 is affecting? Our mental well-being, you know, our digital life, um, our academic life, our educational life, you know, how it is changing the world. And then we also try to look at what what would be the new normal and what role would media and information literacy play um, in a post um, in a post COVID nineteen world? So we've been very very active and functional. I mean, a lot of the youth members from the steering committee they are here listening, and you know they're looking forward to working with as many partners and as many organization as possible we want to support the, um, the work that we do and you know we're also looking at um, currently we're working on a project to help youth organizations um, develop um, MIO specific policies to the programs um, to the programs that they do you know um, you know making MIO an integral part of organizational policies and not just one side project or one side thing that they recognize that it exists but now making it an integral part of their policies and we're not just doing that we're helping these organizations build the capacity to develop the policies and also to be able to practice and implement the policies in their region. And we're also we're doing this across all of the five um, regions. And we're looking at working with about 74 youth organizations spread across all of the five um, regions that UNESCO work with um, evenly. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for a very enlightening uh, input there. We actually wanted to engage you a little, a little longer on that but uh, i think in the interest of time uh, we can do so much with the information that you've uh, shared so far um gwen um what do we have next i i'm, I'm told that uh, we now have uh, julie bossetti he's a research director for the international center for journalists and author of several studies published by uh, unesco uh, one which she will present about at the end of this session, but uh, uh, of course, uh, she will be moderating the next session, which has uh, very prominent uh, 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 participants there. Maybe you can just introduce them uh, briefly. Of course, uh, uh, Julie will introduce them also, but it's important maybe just for the audience to know who are, who are the coming up uh, participants. Thank you, Toyva. I think Julie has been doing, she's research director for the International Center for Journalists. Um, and as you said, she's done a number of studies for UNESCO, one of which she will present at the end of this session. And most importantly, she's done incredible work uh, on the issue of online violence against women and women journalists. And in particular, she's analyzed, for example, Maria Ress's Twitter account and the amount of hate speech that comes after a, a renowned journalist like that. So yes, we're gonna hand over to Julie shortly. Uh, the, some of the participants include Professor Alice Lee, Department of Journalism at Hong Kong Baptist University, Eric Valmier, Secretary General for Information Radio France, uh, Matt Britton, President of Google Europe, Middle East and Africa, and Patricia Nicole Lucena, Executive Director for the organization Youth Advocates Building Opportunities and Networks in, in Governments. So can I ask if Julie is online to take it away? Hi, Julie. 
It's all yours. Uh, Julie, your mic seems to be off. Uh, your mic seems to be off. Just, uh, just make sure. Just give us a second or so, Julie, from our end. Hello, can you hear me? There you go. Wonderful, yes. Please, Please go, uh, ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Um, we're out in the tech Netherlands, and I'm afraid I'm terrible feedback as well as our, as our previous speaker was. So I'm going to take my uh, earphones out and um, people are just going to have to wave if they want to <laughs> intervene. Um, but I hope that uh, wherever you're watching this, um, you're able to get uh, some value, um, some encouragement um, and some inspiration about uh, the, the critical issues uh, connected to media and information literacy, particularly at a time where we have uh, a, a really toxic online uh, environment to try to wade through. We have viral disinformation. We have networked hate speech. We have a range um, of challenges, not least being uh, attempts to erode trust in facts and uh, quality independent journalism, which is uh, at times instigated and fueled by political actors. So this is an extremely complex problem um, that we're trying to respond to through media information literacy, and it is not a standalone solution. I just want to acknowledge that up front. So this conversation, though, um, with all of that in mind, will focus on the value of media information literacy as an intervention, as one of the tools uh, in the uh, toolkit, if you like, for responding to disinformation and ensuring that information as a public good is able to be surfaced. Um, so as Gwen suggested, we have uh, Professor Alice Lee, um, who is the Professor uh, of Journalism uh, at the Department of Journalism at the Hong Kong Baptist University. We have El Eric Valmer, who is Secretary General for Information from Radio France. We have Matt Britton, uh, who is the President of Google in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and also uh, Patricia Lucena, who is Executive Director of the Youth Advocates Building Opportunities and Network in Governance, which is uh, shortened to Yabong, which is much easier to say. Uh, and she is in the Philippines and she'll bring a perspective on youth uh, in the Philippines. So Matt, I'm hoping you can now um, hear me. And I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. Can you indicate if you can hear me, Matt? Okay, I now seem to have lost all audio. <laughs> uh, Matt, um, if you can hear me, I'd like to um, ask you, based on the significant investment that um, Google has uh, recently made in Europe and its ongoing interest in media information literacy as a response to some of the challenges that I just outlined, what is Google's motivation in investing in this? I mean, what do you want uh, individual users and communities um, who rely on Google's products for a variety of purposes to have um, in the way of defences to deal with some of these challenges. I can't hear Matt. Yeah. So, so sorry, Julie. Um, you you seem to only have uh, Alice uh, online so far. Maybe you can start a conversation with her while others are still uh, joining in. Uh, sorry, that... Alice is with me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that, that we that yeah. <laughs> Alice Alice is there. Maybe we can start with her because. Uh, 
Let's do that, Alice. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> this sorry. is um, Media and Information Literacy 101, making sure that the technology is working before you try to have a live, real-time conversation. Uh, but we're working through it together, which is how it should happen, collaborative responses. Um, so, Alice, we didn't get to hear in detail um, – I'll just take my earpiece out again due to the feedback – but we didn't hear in detail uh, what, what was originally planned, which, as I understand it, was a discussion about uh, a new framework um, within the UN uh, Human Rights Committee um, dealing with um, media and information literacy and children specifically. Um, I'm just wondering from your point of view, um, and I hope you've had a chance to examine um, that process, which uh, was the subject of that planned conversation, but um, that, as I understand it, is uh, – a process that mostly considers the dangers of the digital environment um, and places an emphasis uh, on how to overcome some of those risks rather than considering media and information literacy also as, as an empowerment tool uh, to enable children to be heard, if you like. Um, so can I get you to re respond to that just from your point of view, um, how can media information literacy not just uh, protect and defend um, children's right, but rights, but also um, enable them to be listened to? Um, Alice, just just get your mic on, on. We, we cannot be we cannot be heard so now we can't hear alice i'm sorry everybody uh, she might just unmute i think she can be heard once that happens uh, now we can hear you still alice Still, still we can't hear you. Uh, I don't know whether. How said. do you want to deal with this? Because I, I think we're going to have ongoing issues with the panelists. But so far, I can I can hear uh, the hosts on the floor, <laughs> and I think they can hear me. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we can. For the hear. sake of our audience, what should we do? Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Alice, oh, this is going to turn up as an instructional video, um, <laughs> I'm sure, on YouTube at some point. But um, Alice, as I was saying, yes. just so, so often I the emphasis is... I can hear your is, questions, yes, yeah. So, so often this uh, emphasis well, is bring everybody back up to date is on defensive mechanisms rather than understanding media and information literacy also as uh, an opportunity to enable children to be heard. So from your um, expert perspective, how do we balance those uh, needs and requirements and opportunities? Yes, yeah, so, uh, media information literacy is important for young people in the digital age. Uh, in recent years, uh, in the field of media studies, uh, more media researchers examine the risks and opportunities of digital technologies in terms of children's rights. So we are moving further away uh, from the protectionist approach and respect children and young people uh, as the independent and key members of our society. Uh, the COVID-19 so pandemic... Go on, yeah, to give us some examples around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. What did that illustrate for you? Yeah, because the COVID-19 pandemic has further pushed our young people onto the internet. And uh, their online engagement provides a good opportunity for them to experience new ways of learning and entertainment, but at the same time also expose them more to misinformation and online risk. The interesting, at the same time, we can see the pandemic also put media information literacy under the spotlight. Many media education programs were launched around the globe, and it is because 
media information literacy can help to fulfill the children's rights in terms of protection and empowerment. So mm. regarding protection, MIR educates our young people to protect their privacy, handle cyberbullying, uh, verify fake news, and uh, counter gender stereotyping. And more importantly, MIR can empower young people in a number of ways. Firstly, it empowers them as wise media users and producers uh, by learning media uh, information literacy skills Young people can adopt a critical stance to information and images they receive, and uh, they also use media to assess, assess useful information that will benefit their healthy development. Secondly, uh, MIR enable young people to apply media information literacy wisely to make informed decisions and express their views. And thirdly, MIR empowers young people to become active citizens. MIR helps young people to develop a healthy habit of inquiry, and so they're able to safeguard social justice and build an inclusive, nourished society that will provide them future opportunities for progress. To be the goal of MIR education is to achieve critical and reflexive autonomy. Young people will become independent thinkers and responsible citizens. In particular, okay. in particular, I think empowering young people to be active community participants is very important. In my university, there is a media information literacy surface learning program. The university students uh, took a media course first and then uh, they were sent out to share their media information literacy knowledge with uh, school school children. And so after the surface, they found, uh, they found out they have a stronger sense of belonging to the community. They found when they equipped with uh, media information literacy, uh, they not only knew how to better operate in the digital world themselves, but also be capable of contributing to society by helping other young young people, you know, uh, to uh, revise or you know adjust their online habits, handle cyberbullying, and verify you know information. So it is worthwhile designing more media and information literacy program to promote youth empowerment. So that is my view. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks for bringing that uh, together and highlighting some of the ways in which uh, collaborative efforts um, within media and information literacy programs can help extend the experiences of, of young people, especially. Um, and speaking of young people, we'll stay on that theme because we still have um, some technical issues going on in the background. But um, Patricia, if I can come to you next. Um, so we've heard from Alice from an academic perspective, from uh, a training perspective. You're on the ground in the Philippines, which is a country that um, I know a little bit about uh, from working uh, with RAPLA, one of the digital news organisations there, which is uh, run by Maria Ressa, who is, of course, the winner of um, the UNESCO uh, World Press Freedom Prize this year. And um, they work with uh, communities and uh, young people and citizens, in fact, on media and information literacy programs. Um, but that insight uh, allows me to see that not only are there some incredibly innovative and creative approaches to MIL in the Philippines, but of course there are huge challenges um, connected to disinformation uh, and freedom of expression uh, restrictions that of course are very much bound up with this. So Patricia, from, from your experience, can you talk to us about um, what you are trying to do, um, particularly considering the almost 100% penetration of uh, internet uh, access, particularly in reference to um, social media use in the Philippines among young people. Thank you so much, Julie. So I am Pat, Executive Director of Yabong Philippines, and I live in a country dubbed as the social media capital of the world with over 76 million active users on Facebook alone. That's almost three-fourths of the Philippine population. Imagine every po profile with diverse stories, 
each with their own personality, biases, political stand, and religious perspective. However, this diversity is accompanied by a never-ending cycle of misinformation. Now that we rely so much on social media to know the latest news and events, false data and information can be easily shared without any credibility check. In this situation, the big part of it is dominated by the youth. And sadly, due to little to no knowledge about MIL, this demographic allows the proliferation of fake news and false headlines. Us in Yabong Philippines, we believe that it is our shared responsibility, especially the youth, to give the right information, but to also so not to assess its credibility and navigate with our rights when using social media platforms. So we exemplify that by embodying our three cornerstone, which are to think, embark, and create. So first is we think. As readers, writers, and near audience, we need to develop critical thinking skills to assess whether or not the information we consume is credible. In Yabong, we teach youth participants to always think before they click. We do this by incorporating MIL into our programs. Before social distancing was a thing, we used to hold camps and mentorship programs that promote critical thinking skills. Pandemic or not, these programs taught us the power of youth-to-youth -youth conversation as the best way to give awareness on our digital rights, encourage citizen participation on digital platforms, and include media and information, in information competencies. Next is to embark. We need to encourage the youth to speak up for those who are voiceless, stand up against those who are oppressed, and spark change to those who are indifferent. This is done through digital campaigns that aim to reach as many communities as we can. One of them is about how to fight fake news entitled Spot the Fake, Stop the Fake. And lastly, create. From, the, from there, we can have a community where we can create dialogue and foster collaboration. These two things are quintessential in a culture of well-informed and responsible netizens. Having done these for years, we've seen how young people have utilized critical thinking skills in combating disinformation on social media sites. More and more have become more aware of the things that they share online through our workshops and projects that we started. I believe that if we continue to re-echo these initiatives, the youth can have the capacity to become change maker and game changers of media and information literacy. Thanks very much. Um, and if I could uh, get a signal, please, from uh, the people at UNESCO uh, and in the control room about whether or not our other guests are available or if I should continue to chat um, just with Alice and Patricia, which I'm very happy to do. Yeah, so... Um, in the absence of any clarity, Alice, I'm going to come back to you. Um, yeah. So just, just in terms of understanding, yeah. though, some of the risks that you... Um, highlighted, uh, particularly in light of the pandemic, requiring many more young people to be online. Um, and, and we've seen uh, through reportage around the world that that has increased um, the risks facing young people um, in terms of the, the weaponization of the internet. If we think about exposure to child trafficking, if we think about exposure to bullying and harassment, uh, for example, these are issues that have been highlighted as potential risks with increased reliance on digital communications. Just in terms of um, your own expertise uh, and in, in terms also of thinking about the ways in which uh, children can enable um, freedom of expression to be extended um, through their online um, activities, how do you practically advise those, whether they're families um, or institutions uh, whose children are more online as a necessity to, to navigate some of those risks and challenges. Alice, I think you're muted. Yeah, there you so, are. Uh, in my city, you know, we really uh, put emphasis on uh, family media education now, uh, because, you know, particularly during the pandemic, uh, the screen times of the young people dramatically increase, right? And uh, according to uh, some survey, you know, in Hong Kong, our young people, you know, spend at least 
uh, eight to ten hours online, you know, using their mobile phone. And uh, most of the time they stayed on the social media. So uh, for many people, for many uh, parents, they're really concerned about this. So um, for uh, many social workers, you know, in Hong Kong and also media educators, you know, we put forward some programs called digital uh, detox. That means we, we just recruit, you know, uh, young people, you know, together and then help them how to uh, try to decrease, you know, the time, on a, uh, cut their time, their screen time. And, and then we give them, for the NGO, they give them some coupons, you know. If you cut, you know, some hours of a screen time and then you can get coupon to access, you know, to our activities or listen to our concert, you know, free, so so that we can encourage them, you know, to do it. And also for uh, the uh, parents, we have to advise them, you know, uh, they really need to uh, supervise, you know, their uh, young people at the young age. Yeah, because we cannot treat the young people, you know, as one homogeneous group, because for mm. the, uh, child in the uh, primary schools, you know, they just go to YouTube, you know, to have fun, you know, and then uh, they just chat with each other. But at that time, they still listen to their parents, you know, that is so that is the golden opportunities, you know, for the for the parents to 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 talk to them and to give them guidelines. But when those students, you know, move from primary school to secondary schools, you know, they think they already grow up and they do not want to to have a check, you know, with their parents. They won't just want to go to the social media by themselves, you know, and to make new friends because they are moving from a new school from a primary school to a new secondary school, right? They they want to make new friends. At that time they spend a lot of time and so that at that time the teachers as well as the social workers have a lot of work to do. They have to guide them and provide them more media information digital program so that they can use the social media wisely and healthily. Mm. And that obviously includes awareness around uh, freedom of expression rights and the risks to children uh, using the open web in states where, for example, there are significant restrictions on freedom of expression as well. Um, so I, I'll come to you next, uh, Patricia. I imagine um, that in the context of the Philippines uh, situation, which uh, again, Maria Ressa outlined for us uh, very eloquently yesterday when she received uh, the World Press Freedom Prize, this is a really um, significant challenge to empower young people in a country like the Philippines where there is uh, such significant viral disinformation, but where uh, the consequences for speech um, can actually be quite severe. Um, and that is true also um, of other countries around the world. How do you try to empower um, young people that you work with specifically in a context like that, not just to understand and navigate disinformation, but to um, protect themselves from becoming uh, victims of, you know, the, the weaponization of the internet? Ever since um, we started shifting from the traditional learning to the digital platform, a lot of young individuals, children specifically, have re resulted to using social media. Um, even those who are not on um, the right age, like for example, 13 is the allowable age where an individual can create social media profile. So this has created a lot of difficulties for people, for even government to, to monitor and create um, safe spaces for these people. However, the Department of Education in the Philippines has promoted this during the start of shift from traditional to digital learning system. So us in Yabong Philippines, uh, we participated in this campaign through online workshops and projects. We have conducted webinars that equip students from public schools on how to spot fake news and how to practice responsible netizenship. For this year, we are organizing a nationwide project with the Department of Education and have student leaders as the participant for our Promoting MIL workshop. Uh, 
those are just some of the few things that we do. So uh, we really believe on grassroots initiatives and really um, delving more into what the youth wants and how can we make them feel that they are important actors in media information literacy. Okay, great. Um, just finally, we've got about four minutes left before they're going to move to the next uh, segment. Um, and we've had a chance to, to speak more at length than we might otherwise have done. But the people who are missing from this conversation are those who are going to represent a major international news organisation uh, on the one hand and uh, a major uh, tech giant on the other. So can I get you both um, to wrap up with, with a minute or so each, reflecting on what you would like to see uh, both big tech, particularly the social uh, networks, and also um, intergovernmental organisations like UNESCO, for example, what would you like to see happen um, as initiated by those uh, actors in this situation to respond to the challenges you're dealing with on the ground? Starting with you, Patricia. I think in order for us to create a credible and safe information space, we need to involve everyone, stakeholders, content creators, and even the government to promote media information literacy. To create that, I think we need to do two things. First is to strike conversation, and second is to promote collaborations with them. These two things are quintessential ways to produce a safe and credible information space. And for us, it is and it is partly uh, it lies on us um, as an MIL advocates. We need to be the beacon of hope in torch bearer of media information literacy to create the conversation and foster collaboration. That is the only way for us to resolve the problems that Miss Alice and I, uh, the things that we have mentioned uh, in this conversation. Okay, thanks so much, Patricia. And Alice, the final final words to you. Um, what, what initiatives would you like to see from uh, either states or intergovernmental organizations, and in particular, uh, from the platforms? Um, I think uh, it is very important for, you know, uh, UNESCO and also, you know, uh, international organizations, you know, to conduct more research, uh, particular regarding, you know, regional uh, situations, uh, because for MIL is dealing with uh, information, even the media, and for those area, it is very cultural specific. So, uh, and also, you know, in different regions, you know, we have different social sy media systems, and also we have uh, at a different level of technological development. So we, we have to do conduct research, you know, to understand those situations and then collaborate with uh, regional uh, academics, uh, researchers and uh, educators, you know, so that uh, we can uh, put forward more, you know, uh, sound, you know, policies. Yeah, and then uh, practical activities, you know, to promote, you know, media information literacy. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Alice. And I'd just like to say a special thanks to uh, Matt Britton from uh, Google and Eric Valmier from uh, Radio France, who tried um, valiantly to connect, but uh, there are some major technical difficulties going on in the background. Nevertheless, thank you so much, uh, Patricia Lucena and uh, Professor uh, Alice Lee. Um, and I'm going to hand back to the floor now. Um, I hope to be back with you at the end of this session uh, with some further insights into um, some research that um, I've done with colleagues from the University of Sheffield uh, around responding to disinformation, including through uh, media and information literacy. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Patricia. Also, uh, we didn't really as I say, miss anybody else because that was a great discussion. So thank you all for, for girding your loins and giving us a really good discussion on the topic. I'm handing back to Toivo to introduce Guy. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Gwen, and uh, thank you to our very lively panelists there. We wish we had uh, all participants in, but I think the ladies did uh, great justice to this conversation. Now, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, uh, introducing uh, Professor Guy Berger. He is uh, the Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development at UNESCO, and he's been very much involved 
in uh, the preparations for this uh, important event. He will now uh, moderate our next four segments, Country Dialogues, UNESCO's uh, Media and uh, Information Literacy Curriculum, the UN system, and uh, then of course have a further panel. I will hand over to Professor to uh, introduce uh, his guests. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, our distinguished champions, uh, Toivo Njibela and Gwen Lister. Welcome everybody here in Vintuk, Namibia. Welcome those online and happy World Press Freedom Day to you. What a day to celebrate. 30th anniversary of the birth of this day right here in Namibia. Well, I've got lots of uh, goodies to provide you, interesting discussions coming up. And the first thing I'm going to introduce is a big initiative at UNESCO to produce a curriculum that guides the training of teachers, but anybody else who's interested, about how to do media and information literacy. Of course, I think you all know that press freedom is the freedom for everybody to express themselves publicly. It's not only for journalists, but journalists, of course, need it the most, or perhaps not the most. Journalists use it all the time. When we speak about media information literacy, it's got to include press freedom, that the public need to know they have the right to express themselves, and they need to know the importance of other people having that right. And so media and information literacy is really important to this question of press freedom. And if you want information as a public good, you need media and information literacy as a public good. Okay, let's roll with the, this video showing you the UNESCO curriculum that was launched very recently. Welcome to the international launch of the Media and Information Literacy Curriculum for Educators and Learners organized by the Ministry of Culture and Media of Republic of Serbia and UNESCO with support of European Commission and Sweden. Media and Information Literacy has the potential to empower citizens with the necessary competencies to address key issues of our time. That is why the launch of our curriculum for educators and learners think critically, click wisely, is so important. Sophisticated and intrusive algorithms have emerged along with deep fakes and other digital illusions. It was therefore essential to launch a new curriculum in response to these new challenges. This curriculum will address new issues like privacy, data protection and digital citizenship while expanding its focus on areas such as artificial intelligence and hate speech. UNESCO will work with relevant authorities to make this possible, as well as with educators who play, as always, a crucial role. As we rely on pedagogy to end hate speech, disinformation and other abuses in the digital world, we're crafting humanistic solutions to respond to the challenges of the 21st century. The COVID-19 pandemic increased both the good and the bad in the communication ecology. Therefore, we need effective development interventions that can help people to benefit more from the good and at the same time self-protect from and minimize the impact of the bad. What is Serbia's contribution to media literacy and what challenges pandemics brought? We will hear from Prime Minister of Serbia, Mrs. Ana Brnabic, who is joining us now. This curriculum is designed to provide individuals and educators with the tools to gain information, media and digital competences in order to be truly able uh, to interpret and evaluate content, promoting media and information literacy as a foundation uh, to live by. We are very, very proud to be able to host this conference, to work with uh, the UNESCO team and, and also to, to, to show uh, somewhat of a leadership role in this in this important uh, uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Prime Minister. This was Prime Minister of Serbia, Mrs. Anna Brnabic. Media and information literacy is a sustainable way to empower everyone with competencies to better navigate the information superhighway. I would kindly invite Mrs. Vera Jourova, Vice President and Commissioner of the European Commission, to share her views on this matter. 
As it was noted, the digital revolution brought tremendous changes into our lives in the ways we communicate and we conduct business and do politics even. It is crucial to support educators and learners, especially in this very difficult period, so that everyone is equipped to assess critically the content that they receive and share in, all, in other words, to think before they click. When digital technology is becoming more important and you have discussions of fake news or alternative facts in the social media and beyond, on such sensitive issues as COVID-19 vaccines, genocide ideology, hate speech, gender-based criminal acts, etc., it's very important than ever to work on such a curriculum. Why is the implementation of basic standards in this area so important? Education today has uh, the responsibility to give every learner the capacity to be responsible uh, and to be uh, responsible digital citizens. They need the tools, they need the practice, uh, they need the right training in order they can be uh, well equipped uh, to help uh, students fast check information, research uh, opposing and diverse opinions. How can we, how, how can Serbia link its experience and knowledge with what UNESCO is, is proposing. What is the idea? We are partners and supporters and with clear commitment to, to do something to decrease what I call uh, internet pollution, verbal pollution of the digital space. And what Serbia wants to do is uh, let's uh, do something and decrease that pollution. Let's do uh, it with the, 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 the might tool that is education. Please be reminded where you may look for the curriculum. You can see the uh, address on the page. Thank you for watching us. Okay, that was a video recording the launch very recently of the new UNESCO curriculum for MIL. You know, there's a project that I came across. It's called S-M-I-L-E, SMILE. Well, you can smile if you look at this particular curriculum. Please look at the UNESCO website. Now, let's move on because time is pushing us. I've got two uh, people here, one right in the floor with me. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Lizette Ferris, who's a project manager and trainer for the DW Academy in MIL. And she's right here in Namibia, a veteran, as young as she is, of teaching MIL. She created a part of the founding team of the Media and Information Literacy Learning Initiative, MILI. MILI. Over the past five years, MILI has reached more than 2,000 young people, five African countries. And I hope that online we've got Shireen Nanish. Shireen, uh, can we cross to you? It looks like we will have Shireen, according to our tech people. I don't see her yet. Let me introduce her, and I hope that we can get her. Ah, there she is. Excellent. Shireen, thank you for joining us. You're based in Jordan. You're the regional coordinator of UNESCO's Global MIL Alliance, uh, the Youth Committee, and you work with the BBC. Uh, you're also the first winner of the Thompson Foundation Journalism Team Now Challenge for reporting on critical youth issues. I've just got two questions for, for the two of you. Um, let's start with you, Shireen, and I hope we can get the audio connected. Shireen, who needs MIL most in your country and who delivers it in Jordan? Uh, we're not hearing you at the moment and, uh, here in Vintuk. Just check Can your... you hear me now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. So yeah. who needs yeah. MIL most in Jordan and who's supplying that need? Uh, thank you, Professor, for this interesting introduction. I first want to say that I really wanted to be there with you in Windhoek during this special day, but I had COVID only days uh, before traveling, So, but I feel much better now, so I'm happy to be here with you online, and I hope everyone is staying safe. Um, 
If I'm to speak about the youth situation in my country, Jordan, I think it also reflects on the majority of the Arab countries that share many commonalities. This is what I can see through my discussions with media professionals across the region. I believe we should strengthen the youth participation in male-related activities as they are an important segment of the society. Young people in the Arab region want to share their stories and own their narrative, especially that a big part of the mainstream media in the region is characterized by political polarization and they want their voices to be heard. That's why we see that citizen journalism, which is, I think, important to creating a democratic media culture, was on the rise during the Arab revolutions and arguably is still. So youth went to social media platforms for this purpose, for the democratization of expression and the diversification of public discourse, because social media acts, you know, supposedly as an equalizer. Everyone's voice could be shared and unheard on these platforms. But then the new generation of youngsters and journalists were hit by the reality, and that is these platforms are changing. These platforms are now censoring what can be shared through the management of data algorithms, which is not necessarily a bad thing. On the contrary, it is something that is essential. However, the problem lies in the extent and ways in which censorship is practiced. Censorship sometimes violates freedom of expression. That's why young people need to be equipped with male knowledge and tools in order to be informed and, and empowered. Young people need to learn that these platforms could be used to setting the public agenda and these platforms you know, sometimes could exacerbate polarization and are not always a safe place to be. And they have to be dealt with wisely. Uh, also, these platforms could in be influenced by governments. And like many human rights activists and reports indicate, they can silence the voices of some groups over others if, if we're not being able to use these platforms in the right way. So I think awareness is key. Thank, thank you, Shireen. Thank you for that. Let me ask Lizette the same question. Who needs MIL most in Namibia? Who supplies it and what's the issue? What are the issues? Also social media, I guess. Thanks, Guy. I agree a lot with what Sharina said. Definitely also the youth uh, population here in Namibia requires it um, a lot for the similar reasons. Um, but also because um, in COVID-19, a lot of people were forced online. So obviously we have low-cost um, smartphones, we have low-cost data that enables a lot of wider access. What we found in Namibia, though, is that the more rural, the less digitalized. So there's still a lot of our rural youth who don't necessarily have access to these digital platforms and definitely don't have the skills. I think people who deliver MIL education, of course, along with DW Academy and Mali, is also UNESCO through training teachers here in Namibia, um, and that then reaches the learners at schools. Um, one of the gap areas that we found is um, involving teachers and more practically out of school systems, but also looking at parents, for example, because we found that younger people are accessing online uh, platforms, and so through their parents, we can reach them at home on on the smartphone of the parents. So we're looking at how do the stakeholders in MIL in Namibia come together and address that challenge and working with civil society in particular uh, to bring awareness. Um, some of the issues that we still find very prevalent in Namibia is cyberbullying, of course, reaching the younger population, but also a lot of mis, dis, and malinformation that's being spread. We have a lot of criminal cases recently um, where people spread false information and they were actually fined. So it's a criminal offense in Namibia during the state of emergency and also we have seen an increase in hate speech cases um, particularly with an example of three teachers who committed hate speech online and they actually lost their jobs so of course these are quite um, sort of relevant but profound examples about the impact um, that the lack of MIL actually have on, on an individual but also on the society at large Thank you so much. So, uh, indeed, uh, uh, you know, freedom of expression is not freedom to cyberbully or to malign people or to, uh, you know, spread, uh, spread false information about uh, COVID medication and vaccination. So, it's interesting that you say that MIL is, is, is key there. Let me stay with you, and I'm going to ask you the last question. One minute, please, just because of time. You, as civil society, you look around and you see it's, a, it's an all of society issue that everybody needs to promote MIL. But what would you say to the government and the policymakers in Namibia? What is the one thing they could do to make a difference 
Is it funding? Is it the school system? What is it? Is it their own example? What do you think? Yeah, I think we need to nationalize it. You know, we need to put it into our national development plans. Uh, we need to strengthen the efforts that are there at school level. Obviously, when you train MIL, you need practical, you need, um, you need internet, you need computers, you need smartphones. So those are all the investments that is required to really make it a hands-on, interactive, um, you know, lifelong learning experience. MIL and the digital space changes so often that there's no one shoe fits all approach. It's not a standardized approach. It has to be individualized and also really look at how do we address the needs of the rural people, especially when we still look at traditional media and radio being one of the most accessed platforms. Um, how do we get people to access, analyze, create, reflect and act on the media and create their own and uh, so have a voice in uh, the wider landscape? Thank you. And indeed, I think you put out a challenge there to the media in your country, including radio, themselves to be start delivering MIL. So let's go to Shireen for one minute. Last word, Shireen, please tell us what in Jordan do, you th what would your advice be to your policy makers to advance MIL on the ground? Yeah, so I think the local organizations should be conducting, uh, sorry, my voice, should be conducting more media and information programs for young people. The training can cover male concepts and skills like understanding social media, and news literacy, and digital media. M you know, when, when young people are media literate, they can express their opinions through powerful st storytelling techniques, techniques, and they can influence also policy makers and decision makers in their region. So I believe in Jordan, you know, there has to be some sort of training for uh, young people, you know, even in schools. And this is, the government is kind of trying to do this right now. But I think a lot of effort should be, you know, put into that. And I think also that, you know, when it comes also to, to young journalists in Jordan, they, they, you know, young journalists in Jordan have a high social media exposure, yet they lack the ability to identify, for instance, fake news or the experience, uh, you know, and awareness required to deal with these media platforms. So th that's why I think that it's important to build capacities of youth on their understanding of policy and advocacy mechanism in the field of mail. This, this makes, you know, media and information literacy an inevitable and necessary response to the real and current situation. We cannot just, you know, choose not to include it in the equation. Thank you, the two of you. I'm sorry we have to move on, but policy makers Please listen to these voices. <laughs> We're going to move to a new segment now, which is the UN system and MIL. And I'm very pleased to introduce a, a video message from Her Excellency Amal Mudalali, who's the uh, permanent representative of Lebanon to the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Uh, she is going to give us a message about an exciting development that took place recently in, in New York at the UN General Assembly. Can we play the video? We seem to have an issue with the audio here in Vintuk. Um, Let's, let's see if we can get that going. I, I can also set up just while we're waiting um, that the speaker after this will be Ms. Zander Grause, who is Latvia's Deputy Permanent Delegate to UNESCO in Paris. So we have uh, two diplomatic representatives, one to New York, who we hope we can get the audio from, and then we have a live direct connection, we hope, with uh, Ms. Zander Grase from Latvia. Okay, I'm getting signals that it's all good. So let's go to the message from New York. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank UNESCO for the invitation to participate at today's World Press Freedom Conference and to thank the government of Namibia for co-hosting this event of utmost importance. It's my greatest honor to be able to speak at this conference.
because before assuming my role here at the United Nations as permanent representative, I was a journalist and a foreign correspondent. Dear friends, at the United Nations, the topic of journalism and the freedom of the press is one of Lebanon's top priorities, and my country is therefore an active member of the Group of Friends of the Protection of Journalists. Just today, the group in New York, along together with the Group of Friends in Vienna, Geneva, Paris, and Strasbourg, have issued a joint statement on the occasion of the World Press Freedom Day, and we proudly, of course, joined it. The pandemic that ravaged the world and created another pandemic of misinformation made information and the role of media not only a matter of freedom of the press and expression, it made it a matter of life and death. We saw that last year the information or misinformation could kill. Hence, the key theme we are focusing on in this discussion, media and information literacy, is of particular relevance in the context of this pandemic that we are still navigating through. As you all witnessed last year, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic was accompanied by a tsunami of misinformation and the deliberate creation and circulation of false or manipulated information relating to the pandemic and to vaccines, which made the challenge of containing the pandemic much harder. One of the lessons COVID-19 has taught us, or rather reminded us, was that the crucial necessity of informing people with facts, educating them accurately with trustworthy sources and making sure they are not misled by disinformation and fake news. This goal can only be reached by promoting information and media literacy, critical thinking, public trust in science, facts, and independent media, safeguarding the freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and promoting the highest ethics and standards of the press, and ensuring the protection of journalists and media workers. Lebanon was proud to be one of the core group members who initiated the cross-regional statement on infodemic in the context of COVID-19, endorsed by 130 countries and two observer members. With the recent, recent adoption by consensus of Resolution 75-267, Global Media and Information Literacy Week, which Lebanon was one of its early core group supporters and sponsors with Jamaica, the General Assembly sent a strong and unified message on the need for all to address the challenges of this information and misinformation. The adoption of this action-oriented resolution is an important step that must now be put into action with the involvement of all, from member states to international, regional, and civil society organizations. On March 26, the political declaration on equitable global access to COVID-19 vaccines, initiated by Lebanon and supported by 182 uh, delegations, was launched in an informal meeting of the General Assembly. In it, we committed to addressing misinformation surrounding vaccination. Dear friends, in the modern digital era, with the spread of information across the internet, individuals must be able to recognize whether the information is true or false. Education is key. We need to educate people of all ages. As we mark the 30th anniversary of the landmark Windhoek Declaration for the development of a free, independent and pluralistic press, I would like to end my intervention by first paying tribute to all journalists and media workers all over the world, especially the Lebanese, and thank them for contributing to making everyday information a public good. Second, to raise an alarm that freedom of the press and free speech are under attack around the world today more than ever. There is a slight back on freedoms and some people are using the pandemic and other excuses to crack down on people's right to speak out. We need to stand up and defend the freedom of every woman and man the freedom of every media outlet, including social media, to speak out whether we agree with them or not. If we silence the press, we draw a curtain on the truth, and democracy dies in the dark, as a prominent paper here reminds us every day. I thank you. Wonderful. We have that message hot from New York about this resolution, which proclaims the last week of October as the global MIL week and it calls on all states and other stakeholders to use that week to promote media and information literacy. Now, we're going to hear a bit more about that and also about UNESCO's work and particularly the role of another country in MIL. So can we see if we can bring in Zander Grazer, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Latvia to UNESCO? 
Ah, good morning. Can you hear me all right? Good morning. Good morning. Ah, perfect. We have a connection. Super to see you. Could you tell us about Latvia's experience in this? Because we know that you were the kind hosts of World Press Freedom Day, uh, what was it, four years ago, and then you also have been co-hosts of the Global MIL Week. What is, why does Latvia take these things so seriously, and what do you do? Uh, yeah, good morning, distinguished participants. Good morning, dear guy, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank, first of all, UNESCO Secretariat for the invitation to address this distinguished forum and also to thank the host country, Namibia, for all their efforts to organize this very important event. I'm particularly happy that my country, Latvia, can contribute to this joint effort of media and information literacy. Latvia's engagement in adoption of the UN resolution on the Global Media and Information Literacy Week was a logical development of undertaken activities over the last decade. In 2014, Latvia hosted the second European Forum on Milk, uh, supported by the European Commission and UNESCO. Um, that resulted in legal recommendation on media and information literacy in a shifting media and information landscape and laid the foundation for an internationally recognized Global Milk Week. This recommendation also called on UNESCO in 2014 to initiate consultation necessary for the tabling of a resolution for an internationally recognized and official global mill week. In 2018, we co-hosted the global mill week, which led to UNESCO global mill cities framework. Latvia was able to pull out these high level events thanks to practical experience in ensuring the high level of awareness about the risks of disinformation, efficient and well-coordinated government communications, trust in independent media. This required concentrated efforts of the governmental institutions, the civil society and the private sector alike. All these partners, including the media organizations, are engaging in a variety of innovative media literacy projects, including outreach to schools, children books, and media literacy games for the young generation. Paying attention to the quality of the public service media was another contributing factor. I am particularly pleased to note that we were able to establish the UNESCO Chair on Media and Information Literacy in the University of Latvia, and another university or uh, already submitted its application to establish similar chair. Our efforts in building the information resilience came first as a response to decades-long disinformation campaign reached out against the Baltic states and allowed us to face the challenge of COVID-19-related infodemia with certain confidence. So, that's the story. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much. Uh, so, just in one quick word, uh, you have been, your country has been a champion at UNESCO and at uh, New York uh, for this global MIL week. So, last year, UNESCO member states agreed it, and this year, the states in, in New York agreed it. And so, what will you do this coming October in your country to, uh, um, I suppose, to celebrate, commemorate, promote this global MIL week? You know, adoption of this resolution is one, I would say, quite a rare case is when the entire world is united behind the same idea. One would ask where from that unanimity comes. And there is a common understanding of both urgency and gravity of the challenge that our civilization is facing. Words do kill. Uh, as the reporters without borders duly noted, media literacy is the best vaccine against the disinformation. Let me just draw another simple parallel to ensure the road safety you need reliable traffic code. Clear street layout and last but not least, people need to know how to drive. 
And as the UN Economic Commission for Europe is behind the road safety awareness, the work of UNESCO is our inspiration in the matters of information awareness. So what we will do this, this autumn, we will uh, work a lot with schools and universities to teach people, to let them uh, think critically and be a very well educated citizens. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, that is very interesting to hear from two diplomats in two UN organizations, and that ends that segment of the UN system. We seem to have some issues connecting to two people for the next segment, so I think we're going to jump ahead a bit, and we will come back to Julie Possetti, and then if we have time, we can see if we can have the connections with the two other guests. Uh, so Julie Possetti, who you saw earlier, uh, she was author of a study called The Balancing Act, which UNESCO did for the ITU and UNESCO convened Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. And that study has a lot about MIL. Julie, can we connect to you? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Indeed we can, absolutely. I can't hear you, so I'm not sure if uh, uh, we are connected. Yes. Oh, now I can hear myself in feedback. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Please thanks proceed. very much, Guy. Yes, um, I've done a bit of work for UNESCO over the past uh, six or seven years, including focusing on disinformation uh, and journalism uh, and the, the nexus of disinformation and, and journalism with freedom of expression. And uh, the Balancing Act is uh, one of the, the books that we've published about that. Um, I'm told that uh, the team in uh, Vintuk is going to screen the slideshow. Can I um, get an indication of, of that? Because I can't see the slides at this point. And I do want to walk you through some data. Um, yes. But just while they hopefully get that sorted, um, I mean, I did, did want to make the point that uh, media and information literacy is, is not a, a standalone uh, information. Um, and, you know, we have to understand that, that we're dealing with uh, online toxicity um, and, and digital hate at scales that have never been seen before. Um, and some of the complicating factors are that these problems um, are instigated and fueled by political actors, including uh, states, um, but also um, facilitated and enabled uh, by the platform. So I do think we need to emphasise that media and information literacy, the set of tools that allow citizens to more safely and effectively use the extraordinary benefits uh, of the internet um, need to be understood as simply one of the defensive mechanisms. Um, so, for example, we can't have a situation where states are trying to justify uh, responses in terms only of empowering citizens when, in fact, you know, political actors themselves are um, instigating some of the hostility and difficulties that we're trying to address. And the same is true of the platforms um, spending large uh, amounts of money, uh, which we welcome very much in terms of strengthening media and information literacy, but in parallel, they really do need to be addressing some of the um, core uh, design failures of their systems that, are, that enable and allow the problems that we're currently talking about. So I just wanted to make those two points up front. Um, and that is the sort of substance of the title of this short presentation. Um, the book you can see the screen grab of uh, on the right there, Balancing Act, Countering Digital Disinformation While Respecting Freedom of Expression was published late last year by UNESCO and the ITU. Um, and it uh, was co-edited by my colleague at the University of Sheffield, Professor Kalina Boncheva. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this slide actually addresses the point I just made, um, and this refers to um, a, a publication that UNESCO uh, released for World Press Freedom Day called The Chilling. It looks at um, the, the global scourge of online violence against women journalists and highlights the problems of uh, viral disinformation uh, and networked misogyny along with um, hate speech that's occurring at scale um, on these platforms. And it really does demonstrate, I think, quite powerfully 
um, the, the need to address the other concerns that I just raised in parallel with media and information literacy. So I just wanted to provide that context that women journalists are feeling very unsafe on social media platforms because of the large scale attacks they're experiencing and their audiences, those people we target through media and information literacy are also caught up and frequently targeted themselves when they raise their voices and try to participate. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, let's dig into some of the uh, themes of the Balancing Act book. Um, now this comes, this uh, set of guidelines here from the UN's uh, Africa Renewal Program. So their suggestion, and we feature this in the book, their suggestion is that uh, responses, particularly at the state level to disinformation, should be based on freedom of expression, um, the notions of uh, freedom of the press, uh, and the practice of high ethical standards, along with an emphasis on journalism safety and, critically, um, a promotion of media information literacy, which, of course, is directly link to, linked to some of the challenges we have that have been so well highlighted by this pandemic with regard to uh, public trust in uh, health information, in science, in facts, and in independent critical journalism. And to the next slide, please. So what we did um, was, as, as part of this uh, very large study, and it's free to download, and hopefully uh, Guy or somebody uh, in the UNESCO team can pop um, the link to the report in the chat, but we um, examined disinformation responses um, from the point of view of uh, the responders, if you like, so the methods um, of the response. And we broke these up ultimately into 11 uh, types of response that were categorised in four different buckets. Um, and the one, uh, at least at my right <laughs> on the screen, responses aimed at the target audiences of disinformation campaigns is the relevant one uh, with regard to media and information literacy. It also addresses um, questions about um, ethical and normative uh, responses, which are tied up very much with um, MIL and uh, credibility labouring and uh, labelling, <laughs> labouring as well, <laughs> credibility labelling and audience empowerment. And if we can move to the next slide again, please. Right, so as part of the, uh, the study, we came up with a new acronym because what is MIL without an additional set of acronyms um, called I am it? Um, and I think this highlights the point that each of us has an individual uh, responsibility and a need for maximal uh, capacity to deal with the challenges that we've just talked about, um, regardless of the role of these other actors that we need to take into account. So this is what the acronym stands for, uh, instigators um, of disinformation, agents of disinformation, um, the messages associated with disinformation, the intermediaries, so they would be uh, largely the platforms, and the targets and interpreters of disinformation. So journalists and audiences are in focus there, specifically relevant to MIL. And moving to the next slide. So if we think of um, media and information literacy as a public good, um, we need to think creatively about how we respond uh, to the challenges that we've uh, heard outlined this morning. And we made um, actually over a 100 <laughs> recommendations in this um, vast report, uh, but let me just distill those for you um, at a top-line level with reference to media and information literacy. So it's vitally important that political actors um, actively reject the peddling of disinformation, and that incorporates um, the, the use of disinformation as a tactic in hate speech exercises, targeting journalists, especially women journalists, targeting uh, vulnerable members of communities in an effort to, um, mal you know, spread malignancy uh, through the information ecosystem. That is something we can't deny. Um, we need states to be funding uh, independent critical journalism alongside media and information literacy, and we make a range of uh, recommendations about the need to blend these efforts uh, with research, um, particularly around the ways in which um, individuals experience um, disinformation online and how they respond to it, so we can better understand the motivations and habits 
um, of those people who are targeted within audiences, um, but also um, collaborative efforts between journalism, uh, educators, um, researchers, um, and UN ag agencies like uh, UNESCO, for example, in trying to address these problems. Vitally important because we've seen this happen uh, uh, pr prolifically um, during the pandemic, and that is um, whether ill-intentioned or not, um, effective criminalisation of journalism and other um, acts of uh, public interest information sharing in the context of dealing with disinformation through so-called fake news laws. Uh, Julie, uh, Julie, 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 Julie. Hello, Julie. Sorry, hello. Yes, yes I Julie you. Guy here from Vintook. I'm sorry, could you wrap up because uh, we're going to have to move to the next session, so I apologise for this, but if you could just give us your final 30 seconds. Sure, if we can just... Just go to the um, the second, the next slide, please, and I'll I'll wrap up. So, absorb some of those points um, on the screen there um, with regard to the platforms, um, and this underlines some of the points I've been saying, uh, making as well, um, ensuring that um, that the, the public interest, fact-based information, including independent journalism, can be better surfaced, and addressing the algorithmic challenges associated with that, I think, is very important. Um, if I can just get you to go to the very last slide and I'll wrap up by su suggesting that people um, access these resources. I know in many countries and curricula around the world, the journalism fake news and disinformation book is being used. Um, and there is a section in there about media information literacy specifically, but it is all about trying to empower citizens and journalists um, to deal with these challenges. And it's now in 43 odd languages, I think, free to download again. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, I hope you've had some sort of insight into the, um, the, the Balancing Act book and that you'll be encouraged to download that and uh, dive into some of the recommendations in more detail. Julie Possetti, thank you so much uh, for the, summarizing that, the highlights. It's a really rich resource, especially if you're interested in MIL, so please do look at that. That brings us to the end of MIL as a fundamental precondition for information as a public good, alongside the viability of media and alongside the transparency of internet platforms. As you know, those are the three sub-themes of this year's Fintook. 30th Anniversary World Press Freedom Conference. So back to our distinguished MCs uh, to introduce the next section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy, for moderating that very important uh, session and very good news about the Media Information Literacy Week. And again, I urge everybody to definitely get a hold of that publication. It's absolutely, as Guy said, rich, a very rich resource and very important in the times we're in. We're now going into the next panel or session, which is Voices from the Regions. And uh, I welcome everybody back. Um, this session is obviously has to do with the regional forums that have been having discussions over the past few days, all related to this conference and the issues that we are dealing with. Uh, but before we get to that point, uh, we're going to have two special guests. And I'm going to start with the first, and I'm going to hope that there are no technical glitches, but let's hope for the best. Um, it's really an honor to have back at the World Press Freedom Conference a, a person who has participated in many of its past editions. Uh, before, as an NGO representative, then as UN Special Rapporteur. But this time, she is joining as the recently appointed Secretary General of Amnesty in International, and that is Agnes Kalamard. She will be interviewed by Geneva-based Brazilian journalist who is specializing in human rights, Mr. Jamil Shard. So I'm hoping we have them on the line, and um, any luck? Because...
Thanks for the insert. Uh, let us see if we have Agnes and Jamil. If we can get an indication from the technical team. If not, we can move on to Alain Modu. No? Okay. Apparently, they just need a few seconds just to, to get that up and going. So, Toivo, one of the critical things about this conference is obviously regional voices. You know, they've been meeting, as you saw on the screen now, uh, the offshoots of the Vintuk Declaration, if you like, were declarations in other parts of the world, as we've both spoken about in, in recent weeks. And obviously, those groups have got together again and put their input into this conference. What are you expecting to hear uh, from the regions when they report back shortly? Yeah, no, no, thank you, Gwen. I think um, what, what is critical is that um, there is uh, variety in, in, uh, in, in you know, this, the demographics of, 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 of events as they relate to, to media differ in different regions also. Absolutely. So when people share experiences from their respective regions and, and then we try to find, uh, to harmonize these views right. into one, uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing because we, what you want at the end of the day is to have a, some sort of global consensus on these issues. Absolutely. And as I say, the more people who are involved in, in crafting, for example, the Vintuk Plus 30 declaration, which is going to emanate from this conference, the better. Um, it wouldn't be very nice if it was just the conference participants here present. But in fact, there's been a consultative process uh, going on around the globe. So we look forward to seeing the outcome of that, put it that way. Thank you, Gwen. I, I'm told uh, we can uh, proceed now. Thank you very much, Toivo. And hopefully now we can get Agnes and we can get Shamil <laughs> online. There we go. We have greetings, Agnes. Greetings, Shamil. I have just introduced you, Agnes, and also Shamil, who's going to interview you, and we look forward to that. Shamil, you have 15 minutes, please, for this. Thank you so much. Take it away. Thank you all. Cheers from uh, Geneva, from the Human Rights Council. Um, Ms. Kalamar, thank you for being with us. Um, we are nine years from 2030. Social realities suffered an important blow with the impact of the pandemic. And we found out the fragility of access to information. How do institutions such as Amnesty look to the future in terms of challenges and how would they use mechanisms already established such as the SDGs and the UPR to promote and achieve concrete results on issues such as press freedom, freedom of expression and access to information. Over to you, Ms. Kalman. Thank you very much, Jamil. And um, hello, everybody uh, from uh, London. It's a pleasure uh, to be joining you. Um, as, as many of you know, I've been an avid uh, participant to World Press Freedom Day organized by, uh, by UNESCO. So it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be digitally present uh, in Namibia. Um, thank you very much, Jamil, for your question. The pandemic... Uh, has uh, highlighted and exacerbated inequality and it demonstrated that many violations are actually hardwired into the governance system of the planet and into the governance system of, um, of many countries. Years of lack of investment, of uh, neglect, um, of disregard for fundamental freedom, of neglect into fundamental issues such as health, have led us, frankly, to our knees in 2020, led us, led the world to 3 million dead and, and rising, as um, uh, both your country, Brazil and, and India in particular, but not only, uh, are, have shown. The... Um, the pandemic has taken place in a context that was already very complex. We know that we are confronting climate change, which has an existentialist impact on, on many people around the world. We are in the, also in the context of reshaping of the international system with 
global powers vying for supremacy, in particular the United States, China, but also uh, Russia. And in that context, freedom of expression, freedom of information has become um, an important tool for um, any of those fight and any of those challenges, but particularly in the way countries are trying to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis those key challenges. Um, we, you know, during the pandemic, Amnesty International and others have demonstrated that governments uh, around the world have uh, violated freedom of expression, have prevented crucial information uh, from uh, reaching us, including on the origin at the beginning of the crisis in um, in China. Media uh, workers, but also health workers, have been targeted for spreading the news about the pandemic. I'm saying all of that because I think we need to be acutely aware that this is not business as usual. We are not in a context of 10 years ago. We are confronting uh, a range of challenges which on their own, just one on their own, will be incredibly tough for civil society and for press freedom activists. But imagine that we have, you know, 10 long-term or medium-term, such as climate change, the reshaping of the international system, inequality that is, um, you know, hardwired into everything, um, economic dogma that has largely uh, precipitated some of the worst uh, uh, impact of the, of the pandemic. So how do we fight back? Of course, we need to rely on the existing instrument the SDGs, the UPR, Goal 16, Target 10, and we will be there, Amnesty International, and I know many of you, on the front line to ensure that people understand that press freedom, freedom of expression is essential to the realization of all the SDGs, because without information, you don't have health. Without information, you don't have women's uh, education. Without expression, you don't have development. We will be there to fight for Target 10 uh, with investigation, with data collection, with benchmarking. But I think we need to be very aware of the fact that this will not be sufficient. And the challenge to us as an international community of people committed to press freedom is that we we'll have to create new instruments and new tools. We can't rely on SDG, UPR and others to protect press freedom, because the challenges are far too multiple and far too deep to be solely, um, you know, attacked by our SDG and UPR tools. So I think the challenge is on us to go beyond these ones. The challenge is on us, and maybe this is something that is coming out of that conference. We need to think beyond that. We need to we need to be aware, in my view, that at many levels, the system needs to be reset. The system needs to be reboot. We are beyond repairs because if we stick to a repair model, we won't be able to tackle the challenges, the current one, but the bigger one that are coming up. Yes, indeed, Ms. Calamara. The challenges are absolutely enormous. Now, COVID-19 was a cautionary tale on the dangers a society may face when information is denied, manipulated, or censored. Since our theme this year is information as public good, how do you see the concrete links between press freedom and those rights that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. right to health, right to life, right to development? How do you see these links happening? You know, your question reminds me of, I don't know, my colleagues at UNESCO will tell me. We met in uh, Mozambique, you know, several years back to discuss exactly that issue, the relationship between development and access to information. There were really great um, uh, panels and discussion. And I'm, I'm making that reference because it means that the issue is not new. We all remember um, the work by Amartya Sen on famine and press freedom. 
And in fact, he probably is absolutely uh, gutted by what's happening right now in, in India. We remember Chernobyl and how access to information, the violation of it had, you know, uh, incredible repercussions on people and continue to, to this day, in fact, any environmental crisis that resulted into some um, legal development at international level around environment and, and access to information. You know, I, I know that for many women around the world, information is key for the realization of their sexual and reprodu reproductive health. In fact, for many men as well uh, around the world, access to information on when and how to have abortion, access to information on um, on uh, ways to limit um, reproduction. I mean, all of those things are about women taking charge of their uh, sexuality and information is key. So again, I'm going to go back to what I've said earlier. There are new dimensions to that problem. So to these links, it's not a problem, it's a clear links. Uh, wh what are the new dimensions? The first 20 that throughout the pandemic and a little bit earlier than that, government chose to reject medical science. Some uh, head of state uh, chose to reject the, um, the information that was publicly uh, available around how to, to fight back the pandemic. And, and by so doing, they killed their citizen. Um, government chose to refuse to disclose the number of deaths. Yes, it is not new, but you know it's happening right in front of our eyes. Um, suppression of key information that would allow the world to fight back the pandemic. And here I'm uh, choosing to name China, but you know the, the, the refusal to disclosure the number of deaths is a global problem. So we have, in fact, um, a coalition of governments that are prepared to withdraw crucial information in the name of their reputation, frankly, or elections, crucial information that will save us, particularly people in the most disadvantaged communities, that could save us, uh, save them from, from death. To me, that is a new dimension that we are confronting at the moment. It is the global nature of the, um, uh, the attempt by government to control information, even when they know that this information could save thousands and millions. Information such as uh, that that is embedded in the vaccination. And here I want to refer to intellectual property right, which I know is a controversial issue. But imagine that right now, the richest government of the world, United States, Canada, European Union, UK, are refusing to lift the intellectual property right attached to the vaccination, are refusing to release the information attached to the production of the vaccines. In the name of what? In the name of profit. They are prepared to let millions die, frankly, so that profit can be made, so that the pharmaceutical company can continue to raise and make billions on the back of, uh, of people's lives. It won't be me who will be hurt by that. Let me be very clear. It will be the people from the most disadvantaged communities. It will be the people in um, global South countries, in countries of uh, lowest income and of the most uh, vulnerable communities in middle income countries. So in the name of profit, our government, Western governments are holding on to information, are holding on to knowledge and are prepared to stop that knowledge from being shared so that vaccine could be multiplied, so that vaccine could be reproduced. That to me is um, the, the, real, the reality of the challenges we are confronting right now. And I, I know I'm not coming up with answers, although I, in my view, there is a very clear answer about the last challenge I've given you. We need to lift um, the intellectual property rights attached to that, uh, to the vaccine. We need to let the knowledge 
We need to share the knowledge so that South Africa, India can produce and produce and produce the dose of vaccine that the world needs. That's what we need. On that very passionate note, Agnes, as usual, always wonderful to hear your voice. We're going to have to bring that uh, segment to an end. Sorry about that, but we're, going, we're really constrained by time. Um, we're going to move on now to our second special guest, um, and he's also joining us virtually. You will have seen his testimony at the opening ceremony telling the story of how the landmark 1991 seminar came about and came to be held in Vintuk. And I'm pleased to introduce, and I hope we have him online, Alain Moudou, who was the UNESCO Assistant Director General in 1991. Do we have Alain here? Yes. Alain, with you. greetings from Vintuk once again. Oh, hello, Gwen. Uh, it's me. First of all, <laughs> I would like to to thank UNESCO, in particular the Director General, uh, Madame Audrey Azoulay, for associating me with this uh, great event, uh, this uh, global conference. And I wish also to greet all the participants. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, went to uh, to be reunited with you uh, after so many years uh, i can't uh, imagine that uh, already 30 years have spent uh, has passed uh, since uh, we had this conference uh, i would like also to to emphasize that i'm really pleased that this uh, 30th anniversary takes place in namibia uh, not only because, of course, it was the place of the first seminar in '91, but also because Namibia is really an example for press freedom in Africa, even in the world. Uh, it's uh, n number one on the list of the uh, Reporter Without Borders, on the, um, let's say, that not only the uh, number one as African country, but even ahead of uh, European countries like France, Spain, or even United Kingdom. Right. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, evoke two persons uh, who are not with us today for obvious reasons. First, uh, Pius Njawe, uh, right. the Cameroonian uh, journalist who was uh, with you when yes. uh, the co-chairman of the, uh, of the seminar and also Ambassador Lambert Messon, who was at, uh, at that time president of the Afri Group in, uh, at UNESCO in Paris, who really supported us and made possible all the results which followed the seminar. Exactly. Alain, it's been so wonderful to hear your voice and have you with us today, just for those, that brief message. And again, what Alain said is so true to recognize also many of the others who were here in Ventuk in 1991. And there were people like Monk Shivute from Namibia, Makani Kabweza from Zimbabwe, um, Oh, Fred Membe from Zambia, Stanley Mulenga also from Zambia, Vincent Chikwari from Zimbabwe, and so many names. I believe we ran them last night. Um, again, we very short on time, but we have a critical session coming up, which is to hear from our moderators from the different regional fora. Um, I'm going to start with a rapporteur from the African Forum, um, who is Nkaba Mashazi uh, from the uh, Regional Campaigns and Fundraising Coordinator at MISA. If we have Nkaba on the line, um, we, is there any luck with that? In the meantime, I will just uh, introduce the other rapporteur. Oh, you here in person. Wonderful. Um, please go ahead and take a seat. And um, four minutes, please, Nkaba, your report back. Please go ahead. A mic is on its way, I believe. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, All right, I'm um, just going to go briefly because I don't have much time. 
but um, the delegates from the Africa Forum uh, were engaged in discussions uh, and there were notable uh, speakers um, who spoke about the subject of the threat of internet regulation, increasing attacks on journalists, the threat posed by COVID-19 pandemic, Good morning once again. Um, all right, uh, delegates from the Africa Forum um, spoke about the threat of internet regulation, increasing attacks on journalists, the threat posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, disinformation to democratic, and the threat of disinformation to democratic institutions, uh, and, of, and the threat, and the importance of a, of a free press to fair electoral processes. Um, in the wake of the COVID-19 and the growth of online platforms uh, and social media, there's a discernible effort by African governments uh, to undermine freedom of expression and of the media through the promulgation of COVID-19 regulations that seek to regulate free speech at a time when Africans need accurate information to make informed decisions about their right to life and their right to health. Um, the need for access to information makes the media an ally of the people and an important cog in the fighting of the pandemic. On the other hand, there are also efforts to spread disinformation and endanger journalists, inhibit the free flow of, of information and images, and infringe upon the public's right to know the truth about the com their communities and their world. In light of the growing threat of mis- and disinformation, there's a need to scale up media literacy campaigns and ensure media literacy is included in school and university curricula. Um, also, this comes when there is a diminishing trust in the media and failure by the media to include women and other minority groups and a lack of diversity, which all serve to undermine the importance of the media. Uh, speakers also reiterated that there is a need for governments, uh, the United Nations and its agencies and IGOs to support public interest media through a global fund for public interest media. In addition, there is a need to develop the strength and the role of media and journalism in controlling corruption and fostering transparency. Uh, and also there's a need to invest in information environments that promote accountability. Speakers say there's need to support effective regulation of social media platforms, in particular with regard to alg algorithmic transparency and fight against dis- and misinformation. There was a proposal to come up with an international human rights framework that governs digital platforms. This framework should also include standards to safeguard women's rights online. To counter this and misinformation, the speaker said there was need to develop the provision of high quality journalistic coverage, and in particular in rural areas, by promoting community media and media reporting in minority languages. African governments were urged to take all measures necessary to guarantee the safety and security of journalists. African governments were urged to ensure the cybersecurity regulation is, is informed by the revised principles of the ACHPR. Declaration on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, which recognizes the internet as a right. African governments were encouraged to ensure that the media is free and secure to ensure that the media can play a role in promoting sustainable growth and regional integration. And finally, oh. speakers demanded for a roadmap upon which countries that enacted a repressive legislation during the outbreak of the pandemic will review and repeal these laws. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and cover some very important points indeed coming from the Africa Forum, and I'm sure a lot of that will be incorporated in our Vintuk Plus 30 declaration. Next up is the rapporteur from the Arab Forum. Obviously, this uh, from the Sana declaration was there, and that is Ruba El Helu, who is a lecturer at Notre Dame University. Do we have her with us? Is she here? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Please go ahead. You have four minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'll start immediately. So the Arab Regional Forum consisted of two panels with distinguished speakers from uh, which pro who provided us with this discussion. The following is a four-minute condensed briefing of, uh, of the, and the recommendations. The opening speech was given by Mrs. Constanza Farina, director and representative of UNESCO office in Beirut. She stressed on the concept of information as a public good in a holistic, communicative, and sustainable process. The discussion started with a panel titled Viability of Media in the Arab Countries, moderated by Nizar Habash from Al Watan TV in Palestine. Then we moved to the second panel titled Disinformation and the, the Epidemic and Hate Speech in the Arab region, moderated by George Awad, Communication and Acclamation Officer, a Program Officer at UNESCO Beirut. The first panel pointed out the importance of sustaining independent media platforms, especially in areas impacted by protracted conflicts or in countries in transition towards democracy. 
We also saw how important it is to build the capacity of journalists and academicians through a training and well-designed, updated curriculum covering the latest innovative approaches and learning objectives. A culture of lawfulness through education, awareness raising, and investigative journalism piloting projects are essential elements to promote rule of law, accountability, and citizenship. However, there are numerous lessons to be learned in areas witnessing war, economic deficits, or pandemics. Journalists there are in need of protection economically, socially, health-wise, and with respect to their security, in addition to the need of a regulatory body to ensure quality reporting. The second panel placed the digital sphere at the core of its discussion, in particular on how to create an environment for improved access to information and for media literacy initiatives and projects to debunk disinformation and hate speech. Several initiatives were launched online at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic through digital forums and online training. Success stories were shared, in particular reaching and promoting media information literacy to females, focusing on the role of housewife, as well as creating media labs to empower journalists and the use of innovative technologies and applications. The role of sarcasm in media in the region is still a very sensitive topic. Can, it can be a tool to combat information disorder and hate speech if the institution is able to build trust with the audience. Many recommendations were suggested because of time constraint. I will highlight a few. Focusing on the role of media information literacy to train journalists, educators, students, or citizens in general. Media information literacy should be a learning tool available to equip citizens with critical thinking, providing protective institutions to ensure journalists' safety and face the challenges that hinder access to information and prevent justice in a wide variety of areas. Creating funds and donation mechanism for under-resourced media institutions to promote independent and free journalism, in particular for investigative journalists to cover corruption, combating lack of awareness and understanding of online platforms and the use of application, in addition to revisiting the code of conduct, should be tackled to debunk disinformation and spread truth. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ruba, for the very brief intervention and very important um, issues coming from the Arab region. Next up is our rapporteur from the Asia and Pacific Forum, that is Therese San Diego Torres, Director of Research, Policy and Advocacy at, uh, in Manila in the Philippines. Is she on the line? Hi. Great stuff. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Therese. You have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. It is my honor to share highlights from the Asia-Pacific Regional Forum, which covered experiences from New Zealand, Myanmar, India, South Korea, Indonesia, and Thailand. In the session on media viability, moderator Ms. Amalia Kabusao from the Philippines noted that journalists are working under precarious conditions with media facing the risk of being captured by political, economic, and ideological powers. And even in seemingly optimal conditions for journalism, such as in New Zealand, some threats remain. Dr. Peter Thompson identified three spheres where problems have emerged, state, market, and civil society. The number of journalists decreased over the past decade, and the newspaper sector's advertising share has dropped. Consumers are embracing entertainment over public service media content. It also appears consumers have not been critical of misinformation, and they have not been careful about sharing their data. Dr. Thompson encourages asking more critical questions about how online platforms use our data and identifying opportunities to push for public interest journalism. On the other hand, all eyes are now on Myanmar, and Mr. Sue Win shared that apart from the shutdown of independent news and the arrest of journalists amid military rule, another concern in Myanmar is the rising racism and racial and religious narrow-mindedness. He noted the need to approach the news from the broader perspectives of humanity and the truth by following the fundamental principles of journalism and at the same time, reporting issues in the proper context and perspective. In the session on transparency of digital platforms, moderator Ms. Vicheka Khan from Cambodia underlined how many people remain in the dark about the inner workings of online platforms and the flow of problematic content, such as disinformation and hate speech. Ms. Seema Mustafa from India proposes worldwide, regional, and nationwide policies, which all ensure accountability and bring in a system of ethics that no platform can violate. She said these policies should be created by citizens 
events involving multiple stakeholders from different sectors. Dr. Min Jung Kim from South Korea emphasized the need for ethical guidelines in machine learning and AI technology amid emerging issues surrounding apps where hate speech and abuse have been detected. She emphasized the need to demand transparency from online platforms, increase public awareness about bias in algorithms, and increase the public's consciousness about diversifying media consumption, breaking out of filter bubbles. And lastly, in the session on media and information literacy, or MIL, moderator Ms. Joanne Ding from Malaysia noted that empowering citizens with MIL provides a long-term response to disinformation and hate speech. Ms. Ika Ningkias described the problems in Indonesia amid the pandemic, such as the collapse of media businesses. Journalists have lost their jobs, and journalists face challenges related to the spread of misinformation, even from public figures. This is why organizations are empowering journalists by providing media literacy and fact-checking training. Dr. Ray Wang from Thailand raised thought-provoking questions, one of which was, how can we educate and nudge people to be more reflective and less reactionary? He pointed out the importance of not only fact-checking, but also listening to different viewpoints, which means there should be more conversations on subjects people do not agree on. Dr. Ray Wang also emphasized the importance of going beyond formal education and ensuring that mill programs and campaigns are inclusive and positive, stimulating dialogue and discussion among the public. Those were the key insights from the Asia Pacific Regional Forum. Thank you so much, Thank Therese, you. for those very important persp uh, perspectives from your region. And I do notice that uh, coming from the reports already in is there are a lot of commonalities and media information literacy certainly seems to be one of them. We now have the rapporteur from the Central Asia Forum. Um, 29 years after the Alma Ata Declaration, and that is Erila Turdubai Bayeva, President of the Association of Communicators of the Krieg Republic. Can we have them online? Are we there? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank um, you. Thank you. At our Central Asian uh, Forum, we had uh, three panels. We discussed uh, strengthening the viability of the media, internet transparency, and capacity of media and information literacy. So uh, the issues we discussed were the um, issues of media in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, and the participants of the forum flagged the following areas. Uh, freedom of expression. Uh, diversity and pluralism of the media are threatened in the region. Uh, safety of journalists is a challenge. Uh, journalists are being attacked, uh, tracking, tracked, tracking, and detainment of journalists are widespread. Uh, no mechanisms of the monitoring of threats on journalists in governmental bodies, and no policies to protect journalists a non-national body to support and protect journalists. And national laws are restricting the freedom of journalists. Uh, local journalists in the region, in Central Asia, uh, they, uh, they, they need education and training uh, to strengthen their capacities. Uh, material to support and consulting for local journalists. And they also need um, skills uh, to use new technological uh, 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 new technology skills uh, data journalism and uh, and also analytical journalism and investigative journalism skills so uh, also uh, the low protection of privacy and personal data so people's uh, personal data and privacy is not being protected uh, 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 and low level of media literacy and critical thinking and um, fact checking and uh, media literacy skills in population and capacity building of um, media literacy educators uh, who are journalism teachers and trainers on media literacy uh, is needed a lot. And we had uh, recommendations of the forum Almata uh, uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, first of all, media viability. Uh, support pluralism. Uh, the media return to the root of journalism. 
I think, um, have we lost Erila? Okay, uh, well, she gave a good summary, I the think. The quantity of, of sustainable. Okay. Thank you very much, Erila, for those perspectives from Central Asia. Uh, now it's time to hear the Europe Forum. The rapporteur from there is Professor Elda Brogi, scientific coordinator of the Center for Media Freedom at the European University, based in Italy. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, happy WordPress Freedom Day from uh, Europe, from Florence, from, from Italy. So, uh, in 1997, uh, the Sofia Declaration acknowledged that the advent of new information and communication technologies representing new channels for the free flow of information could and should contribute to pluralism, economic and social development, democracy and peace. 24 years later today, we still think that the internet is a terrific tool that allows the diffusion of information and contributes to democracy, but press freedom needs to be asserted again against not only the control by the states, but also against the control of online platforms, the giants of the web. Information as a public good must be safeguarded in the online environment. The European Forum discussed uh, some of the risks for pluralism and democracy in the new media and information ecosystem. And uh, it did it having regard to the European way of doing it, uh, to how European countries, the European Union, the Council of Europe and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe are trying to tackle such risks. One of the main issues at stake in the online environment is the spread of disinformation, particularly when it has an impact on the integrity of the democratic debate and on elections. Public, truly independent oversight and co-regulation has become the preferred type of governance when it comes to rules for content creation online in Europe. In that respect, the EU, the European Union, is slowly moving away from the idea of leaving to the platforms the task to merely self-regulate, and it's preparing a set of policies and stricter rules to enforce increased transparency and accountability for platforms. This includes a Digital Service Act and a regulation of online political advertising. Restoring trust in media is another cornerstone, a policy that needs to be addressed. And it can be done with the media and information literacy, giving individuals the necessary tools to critically navigate and select the huge amount of information and disinformation they are exposed to. At the same time, support to independent media and an increased protection of journalists must be ensured. Distrust in media has a terrible impact on the safety of journalists online and offline and on downgrading of the profession. The European Union is, in this respect, working on a Media Freedom Act. Another takeout is that being information a public good, it must be supported and funded as such. The news media sector faces market failure and urgently needs new funding models, a mix of private and public, as well as increased direct and indirect public support, fully taking into account the respect for editorial independence. It's also important to sustain funding to independent public service media, as well as uh, journalists' author rights, fair remuneration and copyrights. All in all, we need a sort of Marshall Plan for the information news sectors. Sector. This echoes the Sofia Declaration. We recommended an independent media loan fund for media in Central and Eastern Europe in particular. And Central and Eastern Europe, last but not least. The emphasis on the online environment should not prevent uh, from stressing that, in particular in some national contexts, some liberal democracies, disinformation is not only shared through social media platforms, but through state-sponsored and government-controlled media networks and outlets. It is particularly important to support independent media there. In conclusion, there is no one-size-fits-all solution when addressing the complexity and challenges for freedom of the press in the online environment. 
but it's not wise to pretend that the wisdom of the crowd will prevail in a marketplace of ideas. A very basic takeout comes from the European Forum. Compliance of online platforms with human rights standards cannot be left to companies alone. The European way to deal with this new information ecosystem is a holistic approach that is betting on new governance tools and on stronger economic support to journalism, on a vision of a democracy that should not be disrupted but enhanced by the new information ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Broghi, for those uh, very astute observations, uh, your region, and uh, to see also the commonalities again between other regions of the world. Our final rapporteur from the Latin American and Caribbean Forum, 27 years after the Santiago Declaration, is Carolina Botero from the Fundacion Carisma in Colombia. Can we... Have we got her online? Thank you. Please go ahead, Carolina. Very good early morning. Hello. Uh, Very good early morning here in Colombia. So in the regional forum, opening remarks by the director at UNESCO's regional office for science outline, UNESCO's call to reflect on information as a common good, as we call it in, in Latin America, followed by deputy regional director for UNDP who called for public and private governance to be used as an important tool. The first panel addressed a very real concern, the media's long-term viability, which has been put in jeopardy even more since COVID-19, to the point that speakers agree with the UN Secretary General warnings about its possible disappearance. The complexity of the situation is complicated by the fact that there are many different realities that need to be dealt by. State advertisement and control and even climate change were mentioned. The experts mentioned also how the transition from physical to digital media had a significant effect in the region, presenting platforms as protagonists that could not be longer could no longer be ignored. The traditional division of journalists on the one side and funding on the other was mentioned as a model that isn't working anymore. Journalists need to address both as critical components of their work. On the subject of the state incentives, there was a call for incentives to be designed from a state perspective, avoiding the government capture and without jeopardizing media freedom. Incentives should be linked to media companies' commitments to keep journalists at work. It must include independent media using the state's experience with local content sub- subsidies. In the second panel, about strengthening the transparency of online platforms as essential pillars for information to remain a common good, the experts agreed that self-regulation, non-regulation, dichotomy must be resolved. And they believe that the complexity of the actors involved, as well as the variety of contents require different approach and multi-stakeholder consensus of building mechanism that seek alternative solutions to that dichotomy. The transition from self-regulation to regulation is underway, and it must include discussions about more and better accountability to include human rights standards in content moderation at all levels. Economic algorithms, infrastructure, and users were also layered identified by the experts at targets for transparency development. A call for regulation to address the complexity of this ecosystem, including assessments of its multidimensional, multi-stakeholder, and a general approach that can avoid regulation of singular products that may not exist even in a few years, was also raised. In the third panel on the challenge of disinformation and hate speech, a call to identify them as two distinct phenomena that are related but should be treated and analyzed separately was made. For the expert, formal media plays a critical role in addressing this situation, delivering quality of of content. Experts also in the region agreed that media literacy is an important tool for viewers to build and improve their capacity to transition to the digital world and understand and deal with this information, preventing the rise in hate speech and its implication. The role of young people, formal and non-formal education system was also part of the debate with important mentions to libraries. Speakers mentioned the digital divide in the region that means problem with access to connectivity and devices and they call for access to the internet as a human goal. Freedom of expression as a key component in this process also requires the understanding that it is not only just a right for all, but also an obligation, and that there is a distinction between ordinary citizens and public or political leaders. The latter must take responsibility for what they say, because in some instances, they are the ones who spread misinformation and hate speech. I cannot close without asking you all to keep an eye on my home, Colombia, 
where freedom of expression is in danger as social discomfort has people in the street, disregarding the pandemic and facing repression. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carolina, from the report from uh, the Latin American and Caribbean Forum. Also very important observations. We have 10 minutes left uh, for this panel, and I believe we will be bringing back Alain Modou to ask for his... Alain, do we have you here? Yes, Thank I hear you. you. Alain, I wanted to ask your impression. I wasn't sure if you were privy to those report backs from the different regions of the world, from, you know, Sana in Yemen, Alma-Ata in Kazakhstan, and Sofia in Bulgaria, all those countries that, and, and regions that followed suit on the Vintuk Declaration. Uh, what do you see the difference as between then and now? Well, first of all, uh, I, I must say that uh, it shows, it demonstrates that uh, the Windhoek Seminar was the beginning of a process which uh, extended to all parts of the world. And it acted really as, uh, uh, as a catalyst. Right. And I'm very glad to see that not only the Windhoek Declaration, but the SANA Declaration, as well as the Santiago, the uh, Almaty, and the Sofia Declaration right. are also fundamental, fundamental texts which are used in all these regions to support efforts uh, to uh, promote uh, press freedom. Uh, this being said, I confess that I, I'm a little bit uh, sad to see that the problems which uh, we had uh, 30 years ago still exist in most parts of the world. Yes, indeed. Even worsen, and new problems uh, now uh, have uh, developed, in particular because of uh, the new technologies, in particular the advent of the social media. Uh, we live in a world today where there are millions of sources, information sources, and it's very difficult to, to find uh, what is accurate or not, what is right, what is wrong. And of course, the fake news is a terrible phenomenon. I have considered the fake news as maybe the, the most uh, perverse uh, form of censorship, because the people don't know exactly what is true and what is not true. And that's why uh, what I call Quality journalism is very important. Uh, journalism, the, the, profession, the, the professional standards of the, uh, of the journalists are, the, let's say, the key uh, for the, uh, the, to, to make information as a real public good. Uh, information should be accurate, verified, and this is uh, the, the ABC of uh, the, the, the information today, the, the information we need to reinforce our democratic systems, to reinforce the confidence among the public. Thank you for that, Alain. I think it's true to say also that what started as a small seminar for Africans by Africans has become a global movement. So the struggle for press freedom is never fully won. We simply have to continue and add as many voices as possible to that struggle to be free. Thank you all for this panel. Thank you to all our panelists, our participants from all corners of the globe. And I will hereby hand over to Toivo. I think the next session is about to get underway. Yeah, thank you very much, Gwen, um, for that able uh, coordination of uh, those very important <laughs> messages from the regions. Uh, I believe we are taking a small break, isn't it? Taking a break. Yeah, and then we continue. But uh, that is my reading of the situation. But uh, yeah, let's take a small break. Starts at 2.30.